Welcome back to the Legacy Podcast, guys. I'm your host, Vipul Basanya, and today's guest is Anubhav Srivastava. He is an Indian filmmaker from New Delhi, best known for his documentary, Carve Your Destiny, which has over 1.5 million views on YouTube. He's also a trainer, speaker, and consultant who has spoken to the likes of KPMG and Tata Power. Anubhav, thank you for taking the time to speak today. Well, thank you for inviting me. And it's hit about 1.7 million views now. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, no, but <clears throat> it's my pleasure, and uh, I'm sure everyone's going to enjoy this one. So the first thing I want to ask you is I actually came across your um, documentary just a few weeks ago, actually, and it struck me as something that was amazing because you overcame so many challenges to actually get the interviews with the people that you've interviewed. So what was the story behind you creating such a documentary? I mean, why does one actually even do that? Okay. So, see, when I was very young, I had this desire that I wanted to impact the lives of one billion people. Not just one billion people, but over a million people in some way or the other. I mean, it's not, it's not that you have to, like, uh, uh, do something huge to impact the lives of a million people. Uh, e even if you do it in a very tiny way, that's still impacting their lives, right? Even if you're able to do it in a very tiny way. So I said that, okay, in some way or the other, I want to do that. I want to do that. Now, what happened? As I started to grow up, I was told that I should start being realistic, right? I mean, when you grow up, your friends, your family, everyone around you, they start telling you that you should just start being realistic and forget all these childhood dreams that you have. And, uh, you know, just give up on whatever things you thought about that you would do in childhood and just, you know, lead normal life, get a normal job and stuff like that. So... As you have seen in the movie, it, it pretty much is the way things went. But then when I was in my, uh, in my college, uh, what exactly happened was that there was actually an international inter-university competition that was going on. And by the way, around that time, I also started reading a couple of personal development books. And I should really credit that book, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. It, uh, it uh, really uh, it gave me a spark that... Uh, Maybe I should give it a shot and see that, okay, if this guy can do it and all these other people can do it, let me apply these things and see if they are still relevant today and whether they would work for me also. So I had this thing that, okay, maybe I, should, I, I still want to uh, you know, pursue my dreams in some way or the other. And what happened was that a competition came up, an international inter-university inter competition. And uh, I thought, okay. And uh, it was basically a business kind of a thing where, where you have to create something like that has an impact socially. Uh, so I thought that maybe uh, if I create, um, if we create as a college, as an institution, we create a movie where I interview a lot of uh, very successful, famous people because we have had these uh, movies in the secret, like in the secret, they have been similar things internationally. But uh, you see, in the secret, most people were from the personal development space. They were not really, uh, they were not really people uh, who were independently recognized out of it, if you would remember, most of, most of them. Uh, they were basically personal development gurus. You've seen The Secret, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, I have, yeah. So, so, so I thought that maybe, number one, I should try and make something for uh, the Indian audience, Indian and international audience also, but uh, most importantly, I should also try and include people uh, who the world already knows, uh, who have uh, achieved extremely successful things in different fields uh, because they would obviously be a lot more credible. And uh, I thought that I should do that. And uh, I also felt that if I was able to apply these principles, then this would, this would kind of be like a, you know, it would kind of be, it would kind of be like a boot camp for me in the sense that uh, whatever my future goals are, if I can accomplish such a young, uh, such a project at a young age, that would really give me the, the, uh, the lessons I would need uh, in order to succeed in the future, if you, if you know what I mean. Because if you, if you, if you try to create something, like if you want to uh, create a project, big project that people would normally say it's very hard to do, and you're still able to do it, that kind of gives you the confidence, it gives you the lessons, it teaches you uh, the importance of overcoming failure at a very young age. So I thought that maybe I should try and do that. And uh, interestingly enough, I got a perfect opportunity because my college rejected the project. They said that, mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my professor said that uh, explicitly what she said was, 
that this is infeasible because the entire institution cannot just do this project because we don't have the money, we don't have the resources to complete this project in the time frame that you're looking for. And they were right. And they were right. They did not. And even I did not have it. But uh, then I thought that I have this idea. And uh, if I have this idea, then, uh, you know, there's this saying over here in India. I'm not sure if you've heard of this advertisement, but there's a saying called an idea can change your life. Have you ever heard of this kind of saying? Have uh, you heard of this thing? In some shape an or idea, form, yeah. yeah. An idea can change your life. It's basically an ad for an Indian mobile company. And that's completely nonsense. An idea cannot change your life. Only the guts to implement that idea can. Only the execution can change your life. Right? So I said, okay, let's go ahead and uh, try this project. Let's try doing this. And, uh, well, it's been quite a journey because uh, most of the people I approached, let's say about there were somewhere around 350 to 400 people that I approached and uh, most of them said no. And eventually I was able to interview about 17 to 18 people. And, uh, you know, people who have seen the movie already know what kind of struggles I had to go through. I mean, most of the times uh, people used to say no. Sometimes people used to uh, say that, okay, we are ready for the interview. And then they would cancel at the last moment. Sometimes that because I was actually hiring a cameraman, so many times I had to pay the cameraman and reach there the, on the spot, and they should still cancel. Uh, and the worst uh, part was the worst part was the absolute worst story was when my father was not well here in India, and uh, I was by the way I was doing my masters in UK at that time. But uh, anyway, so I was not planning to return to UK very soon. I was planning to return to UK maybe later on. But basically, what happened was I happened to get an interview with a very famous author in UK. And my father was not well, uh, but he said that I would not get the opportunity to meet this author again. So I went, I flew to London, I reached there. And the moment I reached, I get the call, I get a call from the secretary saying the interview is cancelled. And I said that, look, I have, I have come all the way from India. My dad is not well, but he sent me here. So she is like, uh, you should be grateful you even had the opportunity to come for this. You should be grateful that we even gave you the opportunity to meet, uh, you know, this gentleman. Well, number one, the opportunity never came. And number two, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, there's one thing definitely that I realized from this is that, uh, uh, you know, many times it's been said over here in India, they say that uh, people don't honor commitments, but it's basically a worldwide thing. <laughs> it's really a worldwide thing. So it's, it's not about whether you're Indian or whether you're British or whether you're American. It's a, it's a matter of character more than anything else. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, is a, it is a matter of character. And it's not, it's not something that you should put yourself forward for if you're not going to follow through with it. Because it tells you a lot about people that are in these um, places and have accomplished all these things. And they still do that. Yeah. And then it's like, are you really true to your word? I mean, how much does your word mean? If you could do that once, how many times have you done that before? And right. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing that you went through that journey and you managed to actually publish the movie. Um, but just taking it back a little bit, when you first started, you, first, you said you had no resources, no contacts, no money, which you clearly stated in the, in the documentary. Yes. How, yes. How, did you, how did you take the first steps to actually approach the first, the first people that you wanted to approach? And how did you know who to approach? Okay. See, first of all, uh, I would say in one way, I was very lucky that I was born in an age where there's the internet. Okay. Because uh, finding out the phone numbers of famous people is close to impossible. It's very hard. Just finding the cell numbers, but you can find out their email addresses. Uh, if you, if you are, if you do your due research on Google or wherever, except for like movie stars and like top politicians, uh, like that's a little difficult, but uh, for the most part, you can somehow find either their email address or you can find the email address of their secretary or you can find the email address of their office. So from there on, it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. The more people you approach, sooner or later, somebody has to say yes. It becomes a numbers game, clearly. Uh, the only thing is that you have to understand that it's a numbers game. And uh, uh, I mean... Uh, the funny thing is that uh, when I started out the movie and a lot of people at that time, they laughed at me. They said that you cannot make the movie because you don't have the resources and money. And when I finally had these interviews, when I finally met the deputy prime minister and the former president of India, 
they're like this is photoshop <laughs> it's almost it's like that. It's, it's almost like that saying yeah. when, when they see someone walk on water, they'll say that it's because he can't swim, right? There's always there's always yeah. some, some excuse that they'll pick out. So yeah, right, right. Mm-hmm. But, um, so like I said, yep. Yeah. yeah, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead, carry on. So look, like I said, it's a numbers game, but people need to understand that uh, most most of the times, uh, see, even the first principle in the movie was all about belief. right you have to believe you can do it uh and what makes you not give up what makes you not give up it's the belief that something is going to happen sooner or later right otherwise if you stop believing that you can do it obviously you will give up so my thing was my my uh, my uh, belief was that uh others have done this other people have done this i mean they have done far greater things people man has reached the moon so why can't i make it a movie Yeah that's a good way that's a definitely a good way to put it but it's it's it's, yeah. it's good that you touched on that point because there's so many people at the moment who are trying to strive for new things in their life whether it be weight loss or um a career progression or a progression in their relationship or whatever it might be a new business they get yeah. knocked back inevitably failure is part of success right and for those who are successful yeah. or are on the path to be successful will understand this but most people who are just starting out they'll get knocked back by the first few tries but you have been no. rejected what is it more than 100 times if i read correctly in, in one of your posts for for all, all, almost about 300 400 See, right. 100 times was when i did, was when i did the bbc radio interview at that time it was somewhere around 150 but when uh, the bbc after the bbc radio interview was done I came back to India and I approached 200 300 400 more people so uh, I think at the end I think the number was somewhere between 350 to 400 people as far as I can remember right with with that amount of rejections what is it that's going on yeah. in your mind how are you mentally keeping yourself together <laughs> what's going through all of this because you have no ounce of proof that it's going to work and I'm sure you had people around you as well telling you you know the closest people to you as well telling you oh you're crazy this is not going to happen oh this is don't you think you're wasting your time you've been rejected so many times you you know you're a dreamer so how do people who are trying to pursue things mentally keep themselves sane whilst going through this process okay uh two things see number one when you actually read stories that's why reading and even watching you know inspirational material is so important because it gives you the belief that if others can do it you can do it too now i'm not saying that go nuts with positive thinking and just believe that you can exceed the speed of light i'm not i'm not talking about that kind of positive thinking but obviously if some something has been done before it can be done again and the fact that when i read the story of very famous people who had uh, received so many rejections and achieved so much more so my and and basically they also follow the numbers game numbers game and preparation and discipline and all these things that are mentioned in the uh, in the book think and grow rich and not just think and grow rich but you know if you read the biography of any successful people it's a similar pattern right so uh when i read their stories my belief was that if they can do it and and they also face the same kind of frustration the same kind of desperation so i kind of put myself in their place and i put them in my place uh, so so what would they do if they were in my situation and i did that okay that was yeah. in the beginning okay. that was in the beginning and secondly uh, uh maybe you've heard of the story before but i'm pretty sure this uh uh i mean this is pretty much the reason that i did not give up because uh, see even after the, let me let me just go a little bit more into into the detail of what exactly happened so after i collected the interviews i okay so i had no background in filmmaking i had absolutely no background right so doing interviews is one thing but making it into a movie very interesting documentary it's a much more tough challenge uh they normally say that uh, to uh, to have a one hour worth of movie that's pretty good you need to have about 80 90 hours of footage which is true because again even from that point of point uh, from that point of uh, you know view that's also a numbers game that uh, the more quantity you have the more quality you can get mm. right so so anyway so i did that and uh, so i did a first test screening kind of thing i came out with the first draft of the movie 
and I did a test training. I invited some people, and they were all bored to death, and they thought the movie sucked. Okay, and you you have to understand that uh, at that point I had put in about five years of my life into it. So I took all my time to interview all these people. I learned. Basically, I, I I learned Adobe Premiere Pro on my own. I had no uh, filmmaking background. I learned it all on my own because I had I did not have the money to hire an editor. Frankly speaking, I did not have the money to hire an editor who would edit the movie for six seven months or whatever. So you do all this stuff and you still get knocked down. So what kept me going? Coming back to your question, what kept me going was the fact that I kind of burnt my Ships. Have you heard of the story before? Mm-hmm. Burning yep. your ships. Yep, yep, yep. You can't go back. That's in Think and Grow Rich. I just read that the other day as well. I was rereading it, and I can't yeah. read that. The, yeah. the, the soldier who leads his his army out, and then he burns all the ships. Yeah. And says, you know, we we have no choice yeah. but to win. Yeah. So he he goes initially. He goes like, you know, King Leonidas, and he gives a very inspirational speech, and then he says, "Burn the ships," and then they have no option. They either have to fight and win. Or they have to die. So for me, if I failed, and people laughed at me and they said that, "Look, this guy tried to do something and he failed," for me that would be like dying. Because I am okay with somebody laughing at me in the short term. In the short term, it's okay. I don't care. But in the long term, as far as possible, I want to prove them wrong. So for me. that was equivalent to dying if somebody you know in the long term used me as an example of failure i did not want to do that so i just kept trying kept trying i kept uh, repeating those test screenings until the point where uh, the people who were in the target audience obviously this movie is not going to appeal to everyone but the people who were in the target audience they all got up and they clapped so at that time i realized that okay you know no matter uh, the same principles that i use to try to make uh, to get the interviews the same principles were used to try to edit the movie and make it into a very nice movie the same principles were used to try and make it popular on youtube because no, again nobody helped me market it yeah. frankly speaking yeah and same principles have been used in my professional speaking business also so yeah yeah that's like, that's that's really is, it's really good advice and it seems like it it all starts with having a burning desire for what you want and it seemed like that's what kept you going because you you weren't going to stop at anything and the other option was just to be the equivalent of being dead and that's the same with me that's how i've been along my journey so far and i continue to to do so and i was having this conversation with a friend the other day and i said the same thing i said if i wasn't doing what i'm doing now I'd rather be dead because I need a purposeful life. I need something that's fulfilling, right, something right. That, that that's whole. So when I look back, so when I look and I look back at everything I've done and the message I've put out and the life that I've lived, I want it to be. I want to be happy. I want to be content and satisfied. Mm. Not look back mm. and think, oh, what if? You know, if I if I just tried one more time, if I just did one more uh, test screening, if I just reached out to one more person, would I have done it? You know, mm. so you never know. You mm. have to just keep doing it. And now mm-hmm. you've proved yourself right. You know, so where you mentally. you're you're a lot more um confident in yourself you it's easier for you to believe that you can accomplish things i'm sure so what is it that keeps you going now obviously back then it was i want to prove them wrong i i need to make this happen for my friends my family myself mm-hmm. what is it that keeps you going now because at the end of the day i know i still have not achieved even 1% of my potential you see man's greatest burden is unfulfilled potential yeah uh, you know on their deathbed nobody really uh, you know there are very few people who basically regret the things that they did most of them they, they regret the things that they did not do so for me my uh, goal in life is that i need to fulfill my potential now sometimes what happens is that uh, see number one nobody ever fulfills their potential truly Uh, even 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 albert einstein never fulfilled his potential but as for if if you try your best then you're going to get close to it so that's my attitude towards life that uh, look i don't want to live life with the regret uh, maybe there's something called reincarnation but i don't know we don't know for sure maybe it is the only life we have so i want to make sure i live a life worth living
Exactly, exactly. I believe the same thing. And it's, it's true because, yes. as you said, you have no idea what, what comes after this. So the short time you have here and you're consciously aware of this mm. life, do what you can to, to make mm. the most out of it. So yeah. just bringing it back a little bit, what, what did you do um, alongside making the film a success? Because obviously as, for a few years, it sounds like it wasn't a success. So what were you doing in between that? Were you studying? Were you working? I mean, what, what did your life actually look like then? behind the scenes. Oh, so, so at that time, at that time, the movie was actually in production. You could say it's a, so there are three stages in the making of the movie. One is sorry, a pre-production. Just, sorry, just before you carry on, I think the camera is just a bit to the side, so your face is cutting off. Yeah, that's better. Perfect. Can you see me? Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, frankly speaking, the production of the movie itself took about four to five years. So what was I doing at that time? I was, number one, I was completing my education. Uh, I did my complete my bachelor's. Then I went to UK. I completed my master's over there. I was at the University of Leicester. Where are you based? Where are you uh, in London or what? I'm in, I'm in London, yeah. So I visited uh, Leicester a number of times, but yeah, I haven't been to the university. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. okay. So I, I, I studied at the University of Leicester. I completed my master's over there. And side by side, in the final stages of the movie production, I was starting to set up my speaking business. So I kind of had to balance both the things. And finally, it was only after I completed the movie that I fully was able to focus on my speaking business. And again, you know, even that took a couple of years to start get off the ground. I mean, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. No matter how hard you try, the next thing is like it knocks you down and tells you that you're still a beginner. Yeah, I, that's just the way of life, yeah. isn't it? Every time you try yeah. to face a new challenge, you think that everything you've done has led to this point and it should be easy now. There's always a new challenge that the universe brings you. <laughs> It, it, it never gets easier. Only the only the kind only the problems change. Only the nature of the problem changes, mm -hmm. but it never really gets mm -hmm. easy. It's like uh, earlier uh, your your challenge was to create something or complete this project, and your set of problems at an early stage of your career are different. And later on, see even if even people who are multimillionaires even they have problems, big problems. It's just, it never gets easy for them. It's just that the problems change. Sure, exactly. I it's see a it nation of problems. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There's always something to face. It just depends on what type of problem yeah. it is, depending on where you are in your life. Yeah. You, there's never a life where you can just sit mm -hmm. on the beach and there's nothing to worry about. It just doesn't exist. Um, but I mean... Some people say it's better. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to say, so just going back before the movie, I wonder what was it like... Mm -hmm. Uh, growing up for you, I mean, in a household, I mean, were your parents um, entrepreneurial themselves? I mean, what sort of environment did you actually grow up in? Okay, so my parents, uh, my father is a government, was a government employee. He uh, retired as a, he was a very senior government employee, uh, but he was still a government employee. So it was not really entrepreneurial. That being said, he was relatively supportive. I mean, in the sense that he was, it was, it was not like, uh, it was not like I am this protagonist in a movie and he's a villain. No, it's not like that. So he was relatively supportive uh, of me, but at the same time, obviously, he could not understand what I was doing. And finally, over a period of time, he started to understand. That's why, you know, in the movie also, he's when he was sick, he told me that I should go because he knew how much that mattered to me. So uh, growing up. I would say my parents were relatively supportive. They did not exactly understand what I was doing, but they were relatively, okay, let him do it. And I'm again lucky here because a lot of people don't even have that uh, privilege. Uh, a lot of times uh, people have to grow up in households where everything is against them. And uh, many times, especially in India, uh, because they belong to maybe lower income backgrounds, so, so, uh, the people who belong to lower income backgrounds, the pressure on them uh, to immediately join a job is much higher because obviously they have to provide for the family. So in that sense, yes, I was lucky that I had this kind of a, a base where I could, you know, uh, afford the opportunity to go after I wanted to do. Now, that being said, even if I did not have that, I would still do it. It would be much more difficult, but I would still do it. Sure, sure. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. everyone's environment is 
perfectly created for where they're going next. So I think the fact that you had that set up mm -hmm. yeah, allowed you to, to pursue what you wanted to pursue in the best way possible. And I think everyone's, everyone's circumstance is neither bad or good. It's just the right circumstance that they need to grow up in for what the path that they're supposed to pursue, whatever it might be in their life. You know, not everyone's going to be a filmmaker or a singer or an author. Some people might be um, sure. some people are cooks or whatever it might be. But I think their circumstance and their environment is perfectly created for them to flourish um, later on in their life. So, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. just looking at your speaking career now, like, do you think the movie helped uh, leverage your speaking career, or do you think you it just you know people didn't actually take notice of it and thought that you know you you needed to have a speaking background now? You've done a movie, yes, that's good, but now you need a speaking background. So you did you feel like you had to start all over again? Did you feel like you had to start all over? Uh, I would say, okay, so when I created the movie, I thought my speaking career would be like a cakewalk. It's not true at all. It's not true at all because I thought that, okay, you know, you have these uh, Malcolm Gladwell and Robin Sharma and all these people, they come out with like best-selling books. I come out with a very popular movie and I start getting gigs from all everywhere. Did not happen. Did not happen at all. And that is why I was also very disappointed that I thought that, okay, I have put in all this effort and everybody saying such good things about the movie. But at the end, I'm still stuck. I still have to do something to make sure that, uh, you know, basically I felt initially that my movie was not helping me. However, so, so I had to do, again, I had to start doing the numbers game thing again. You know, we, we talked about approaching people, sending out emails to people. I had to start doing this again, uh, this time only towards the companies who would be hiring me, right? It's, it's, a, it's basically like cold calling, but you're doing cold emailing here. So while uh, uh, the movie did not help me as much as I wanted, at the same time, it gave me the credibility for people to take me seriously when I approach them. So when they read my email, uh, or when you approach somebody and you send them a proposition, 90% <clears throat> are going to ignore you, or maybe 95%. And the 5% are going to evaluate as to what makes this guy credible to help me. And there, that is where the movie helps me, to help me uh, get the credibility land the first speaking gig and the second keep speaking gig and the third speaking gig and over a period of time when you start speaking with multiple companies and that itself kind of uh, then you know no longer at this point of time maybe i don't need the new movie as much as uh, i i did at the starting of my speaking career sure yeah no it makes sense because then you can use all of the speaking gigs you've done previously as a, a way to leverage the next gig and the next gig after that so right. it, just, it just builds momentum in itself doesn't it once you start going then it becomes easier and easier in some shape or form so i mean when you did when you started out your speaking career i mean for those who are looking to to head in that direction to become a speaker or mm. all that, what was it that you said to them i mean what was it that you were trying to offer because at the beginning as you said people invalidate you because they think oh, you haven't spoken anywhere what makes you so good so what was there a framework you followed did you make it up yourself did someone help you with that i mean how did that work for you okay so uh the absolute first thing that I did uh, when I started my speaking career was I just approached a bunch of universities and colleges. Uh, I did not go for the corporate route initially. So I approached a bunch of universities and colleges and a few of them invited me and I did the talk. But, uh, and it was good. It was fine. But the thing again is that uh, in India or maybe not, in, not just in India, everywhere, uh, uh, it's very hard to actually make money in the education market if if you are offering uh, le le okay okay so let's say I send an email to uh, the vice chancellor of a university saying I can do a speaking session for your students now the vice chancellor is going to think how the hell is going that benefit me how the hell is it going to benefit my or uh, my my university. It's going to help the students. That's the way they think. I mean, they are going to charge a lot of money from the students. But uh, when it comes to actually providing something to the students, then they say they are out of budget. 
then they, they don't have the budget. So for me, I don't know for others, but for me, uh, the education market was just not worth it in terms of the you know, return on investment. So I decided to go the corporate route. And uh, so I started to approach these people and I basically said that I tried to get into the mindset of a business owner as to exactly uh, what a business owner want. He would want, he or she would want the employees to be motivated. They, he, they would want the employees to be uh, more productive and uh, they would want uh, them to be better salespeople, especially for the people who are into sales because they basically drive, drive the revenue. So these are some of the topics that I started pitching them. And uh, yes, over a period of time, it, uh, that is how uh, you know, things started really uh, picking up because I kind of figured out what exactly the needs were. But again, I would still say it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. Initially, in any business, you know, why do most people fail in business? You know why? Do you know why most people fail in business? Why? Tell me. Why? It's because they have no idea how tough it's going to be. They just have this, they, they just have this uh, dream that they, they, they see, okay, this guy succeeded. This, they basically have the survivor bias. You know, ha, you, have you heard of the survivor bias? I haven't actually, no. Okay, so survivor bias basically says that uh, uh, it's basically about people only study those who succeeded. They do not, do not study why uh, those who failed failed mm. i mean you understand so Thank there are many you. reasons that somebody can somebody can be successful luck is also a factor it is a factor so uh, but you have to really study why people fail and uh, what i have seen is that most people they uh, they go into starting a business but they have the mindset of an employee mm. you can never succeed in business if you have the mindset of an employee then you should stick to a job to succeed in business, you have to first get into the mindset of an entrepreneur. You have to have the ability to tolerate pain. You have to have the ability to uh, go for two years, three years, four years, depending on how long it takes uh, to, uh, to go, you know, to, to make sure that your business stays in business. It doesn't, uh, uh, you know, completely uh, go under. And for that, again, you need savings. And now most people don't even know how to save money. They're going to spend money everywhere. So how the hell are they going to have any money to help them survive when the business uh, is, you know, needs that push during the first two or three years? So, 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 so for any person who's, who's really starting a business, I would first, number one, I would recommend them. Uh, if you are in a job, then keep your job as far as possible. Don't immediately quit your job. If you quit your job, then you have to be number one, you have to be prepared that for it to fail, you have to be basically uh, go into this with the mentality that we are going to fail or we can fail. I'm not saying, no, sorry, not, not we are going to fail, but we can fail. And for some, for some years, what we're going to do is uh, uh, what we need to do is to make sure that we have the savings that is going to make sure that we stay afloat. And if you can make through that time, two or three years or whatever it's different for different businesses so i cannot just say generally it's going to take that long but uh, in, on general on general it takes about two years for the business to really start rolling so in that sense you have to be realistic most people are like i'm gonna quit my job and uh, uh, in two months i'm gonna find a investor and in three months uh, i'm gonna go public <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so that's not how it works yeah definitely and i think for people who have gone through that journey like yourself Definitely know that it's Definitely. not easy for sure because you've got to go through um, your fair share of struggles before you can actually get to where you need to be because it's all about molding your character along the way. That you, you can't really enjoy that success unless you've gone through some level of pain. I think you know. I think that's yes, that's, yes. The, that's the role that pain or, or tolerance of pain plays. Um, I mean, how, how did you? How what's your views and thoughts on on pain now that you've gone through those few years? Okay, before, before that, I just want to ask you, have you heard of something called the 10x rule? I have, yeah. yeah. You have, right? Yeah. So yeah. whoever starts a business, they have to really follow that. Why? Because, uh, because there are so many unanticipated events, crises, things that can happen that uh, you really need to account for that. So, so your, your levels of activity really have to be about five to 10 times what you think they are going to be. 
so yes and your second question was what about was about pain your, your, about yeah pain. yeah your perception on pain now now that you've gone through your your fair share of struggle mm-hmm. up to this point what what would you say to mm-hmm. the people that are starting out i mean what's your view on pain now okay so um, see pain is important but pain is of two kinds the one pain is a good pain so when you lift weights you are sore it's a good pain but if you fracture yourself then that's a bad pain that's not really going to help you so what you really need to do in the initial stages apart from being prepared to survive for the uh, for the first few years is that you really need to figure out the right direction and how do you figure out the right direction how do you figure out the right direction what's your view on that you mean in terms of purpose as in finding out what what your purpose is for your business or uh no no just 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 finding the way your business would succeed how do you figure out the right direction um it's more about i think for me it's more about understanding first of all what it is that you're trying to achieve um and then mm-hmm. going about a, a plan to actually execute on that so how are you going to make right. sales how are you going to market it uh, do you need to have a team what job are you going to play in all of that uh, do you need to outsource um you can't mm-hmm. go in with a mentality of i'm going to do everything you need to have Mm. Really plan everything out, and then and then follow through. Right. And also have uh, a little bit of space to account for the fact that things are going to go pear shaped completely. Yeah, yeah. So you're absolutely right. But there's one more thing that I've really uh, found that has been tremendously useful uh, to me. It is the importance of learning from somebody who has already did that before, who has already did what you want to achieve. if you follow their footsteps you might not become as successful as them so i'm not again again i'm not saying that you should just follow one person's uh, 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 path maybe just study 5 to 6 or 10 people who in your line of business have really succeeded and as far as possible just emulate what they have done now uh, does that guarantee your success no but it raises your probability of success it's kind of like this it's kind of like you want to go somewhere and the person who has already gone there is giving you directions mm. is teaching you the direction otherwise you're just lost in the woods what the hell am i supposed to do yeah that makes a lot of sense it's something that i've learned over the last few years mentorship is is a very key skill in terms of saving time and money mm-hmm. and doing it the right way from from the get go it it definitely helps so i think you're right you know i agree the first thing you should do is figure out what you want to do first what it is what line of work what type of business and then who is the best in that business or who is the best person you know that you can reach out to to initially learn what the beginning few steps are and then as you go on you as you get out to more and more people as you make your levels yeah exactly so but mm-hmm. you know touching on that point you said about direction my initial perception of that question was you know about purpose so i want to actually ask you that now okay. how okay. did you how, how did you actually figure out what you wanted to do with your life because a lot of people are stuck you know they don't, they don't, they they mm-hmm. have feeling of you know I want to quit my job I want to live the dream but how do I go about it what what is it that I want to do how do you figure it out how did you figure it out how did you figure it out so uh you see everybody in this world everybody in this world wants success on some level or on the other everybody wants to be a movie star look okay, every or most people Uh, so you could say okay my purpose is i want to be famous my purpose is i want to be rich or whatever their purpose whatever they think their purpose is but see that is a wish and everybody has wishes but there's something that is called desire which is again been mentioned in that book uh, think and grow rich now a, a desire is something that if you don't do it it's if you if you don't follow it it starts killing you from inside okay and uh, unfortunately for most people they have not found that one thing that if they if they don't do you know see most people the fact of the matter is most people are not uh, going to find their purpose ever in some ways you have to be blessed in that sense that you have to be lucky enough to have an idea of what exactly you want and then what you need to do is you have to uh, once you know what you want see be, be, even then uh, you know saying that you want something is a very general thing because 
everybody wants a lot of everybody wants the riches but how many are willing to pay the price so if you're willing to pay the price if you're willing to go through years and years of rejection if you're willing to pay uh, the price of rejection humiliation and all of that and you still want your success and i guess i'll tell you what if you're willing to go for your goal and you put your entire life on stake for that and even if you don't succeed you're still okay with the idea of continuing to try until you die only then i will say you have found your purpose mm. so basically what i mean to say is that if you're not willing to die for it that's not your purpose yeah if you're not willing to die for it it's not your purpose if 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 you uh, the rocky story have you heard of the the rocky story uh, sylvester stallone's i i have but please 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 share it for anyone who's listening who hasn't sure 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 so uh, uh so how long how, how much time do i have to tell the story oh as much time okay. as you need go for it keep going okay keep okay going. okay so this is a story it's a very famous story about how sylvester stallone got the movie rocky made and uh, the story has also been shown in my movie so if every anyone wants watches my movie they can also see the story towards the end so basically what happens is stallone uh was initially he was he had was this aspiring movie actor like millions of other actors he did a lot of b grade movies he even did like soft core porn movies also he was in that <laughs> kind of bad situation he did so uh he uh but he knew that he did not want to keep doing that for the rest of his life so what used to happen was that he started approaching agents basically auditioning for roles again and again and again and he was rejected again and again because you know he had like paralysis of the face and nobody really thought that this guy had what it takes to be a movie star so finally he figured out that i need to change my path and that's again a very important a uh, thing that we all need to learn is that we need to be willing to change our paths i mean as if see if if as long as you're getting to the to the destination does it really matter what path you take no right so exactly. uh, if yep. one if one path is not working and you've tried this 100 times maybe you should try a different path as long as it leads to the same destination mm. so what he did was he said that uh, i need to try something else so uh he started basically writing scripts and again scripts were not really working but at the same okay so one what as far as i remember something really bad was happening at that thing what was happening was this guy was married okay so this guy was married again and he did not have a supportive spouse his wife was screaming at him all the time uh, you know it's there's a very funny joke regarding this you know an idea can change your life but your wife can change your idea <laughs> <laughs> so so so, so. and that's true for husband also by the way so uh, she was basically screaming at him all the time that you go get a job and uh, but she knew that i want to be an actor but he ultimately they had no money to even even uh, basically have food so he had to basically end up selling his dog he had a big uh, dog i think he, he had a mastiff his name was butkus and he's he's also in the rocky movie so he ended up selling that dog to somebody for i don't know the exact amount but he basically sold the dog for about 50 dollars as far as i remember i could be wrong so the night he sold that dog he went home and he cried but after a few days he went to a exhibition bout between two people one was a very famous guy called muhammad ali the other guy was chuck webner an absolute unknown who nobody thought would be able to beat muhammad ali but to the surprise of everyone uh, chuck webner almost knocked down ali and he lost in 15 rounds with him and that's where stallone got the idea of a movie where there would be an absolutely unknown boxer whose name was rocky and that boxer would again try to you know beat the world champion in the movie and ultimately you know uh, try to fulfill his dream so he goes home he writes a script for rocky in 3 days and he starts pitching it to producers luckily for him uh, there were a couple of producers who liked the script so finally you know this change of path actually worked so he was trying to audition so many ways but uh, it wasn't working but he changed his path and it worked so they said okay we love your script we love we love your script we're going to buy the script uh let's go so 
the Stallone says, uh, Stallone is very happy and he says, awesome. Uh, but you know one thing, I want to star in this movie. And uh, they were like, are you nuts? We're going to have a famous movie star. We're going to have like someone like Burt Reynolds or some, some, a- anyone who's a really a bankable movie star of our times. We're going to have that. Because we can't take a risk having a guy like you, you know, jump in a movie and basically have it become a flop. So he said, so Stallone, a guy who was absolutely broke, who had no money to eat, that guy said no to $100,000. He said no to it. He said, I, I, I am not going to sell the script if you don't cost me. So after a while, the producers realized that this is a very good script. They offered him $200,000. He said no. They offered him $300,000. He said no. Finally, he went, they, the script went to around $350,000. And he still said no. So why did he say no? Why did he say no? You know why? Because Stallone said that if he had in the back of his mind, his purpose of becoming a movie star was much greater than the instant gratification of $350,000. Now, how many people will be able to turn down $350,000 to get a leading star in a movie, uh, to get a leading role in a movie that might not even work? That might even turn into a flop because you never know it's going to work or not. But he did. And he actually said, the reason he did not sell the script was that in the back of his mind, he had this idea that if he sold the script, even for $400,000, and that movie became a huge hit without him, he would jump off a bridge. It was that. Yeah. And it's a, a, very, a very deep story. And, uh, and you, you, you told it in a very great way as well. It's not even over yet. It's not even over yet. But oh, oh, yeah. keep, keep going. No, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I, I wanted to pitch okay. in. I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut until you finish. Go on. <laughs> There's a lot to say about you can that. Edit it. You, can, you, you can edit it out, the, the boring portions. You can cut it out later on. <laughs> so uh, so uh, what he did was uh, finally the producers came back to him and said that you're nuts. We know you're nuts, but you have a great script. We're going to offer you $25,000. We're not going to offer you $350,000. You're going to start in this movie, but we're going to offer you $25,000 only. Do you want to take it or not? He said, yes, I want to do it. And then he goes. The first thing he did was he goes back to the man to whom he sold the dog. To sold, he sold his dog. The man would not sell the dog again. So he tried, begged, begged, begged. And finally, the man to whom Stallone sold the dog agreed to sell the dog back for $15,000. And Stallone agreed because he loved the dog and he got the bag, got the dog back. The dog is in the movie, but this is Stallone's real, was Stallone's real dog. The movie became a huge hit, massive hit, and it still turned Stallone into a massive household name, a uh, massive star. So basically what it really says is that, you know, no, don't be disheartened when things get hard because if they were easy, everyone do, everyone would do it. You know, to really become an inspiration to others, you first yourself have to travel that path. And only then you can become an inspiration to others. Just look at Stallone. He traveled that path. He had that persistence. He had that burning desire. And today he's an inspiration to millions, hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. yeah. I, don't think. <laughs> mm. I, I don't think there's much more to say than that because we see so many people in movies and, and um, auditions, you know, pitching themselves. And a lot of them are successful and some of them aren't, but you never hear the stories about the, you know, what you just said about um, Stallone's upcoming. Someone that big, you wouldn't think to question him. You just think, oh yeah, it's Stallone, you know, he, he, of course he's going to be in the next movie, you know, and then every time you hear his name, you're like, oh, that must be a good movie. Well, Stallone's in there. But you never see the, the actual path that he followed in order to get the fame and the riches, the wishes you were talking about that everyone wants. Um, right. And it's, it's important to see that, you, you know, and they said this in Even Grow Rich, you can't attain something for nothing. He had to exchange exactly. a portion of his life, a portion of his food, mm-hmm. his income. He had to give up, his, you know, flourishing in his relationship for a short period of time in order to receive it. But then it came in the end, if you're willing to stick with it. Yes. And you also have to be, one more thing is, at the same time, you also have to be willing to do it even if it fails, you know, uh, like I said, I mean, I mean, uh, for Stallone, it worked out. Now, some other dude might do the same thing and might do 
you might put in all all of that time and effort into creating something and uh, it might not get the result that they were hoping for so the my point is that you have to be willing to do it even if there's a huge chance of failure even if it fails the point at the end is that uh, like i said you know your attitude should be that i am going to try do i'm going to try for this towards the end of my life till the end of my life i'm going to try my best and guess what even if i die trying to do it and i don't achieve it even then just trying for it was worth it that's the kind of attitude that you need to have otherwise you're going to quit yeah I, and i think that's that's the whole point we made earlier about that being your purpose if you can have that attitude towards whatever it is that you want then you know for sure that's your purpose so i think it's it's a good way for people to actually look at their situation and think am i willing to die for this and if i'm not then i need to change and and think about what it is that i actually want and um and follow through with that so no it's been a, a amazing speaking to you so i want to wrap it up with three questions that i ask everyone and okay. i'm interested to see what you'd have to say so the first one yeah. is with the knowledge and experience you have now if you were to go back mm. to your 18 year old self and tell him mm-hmm. something like what would you tell him okay so uh first i would tell him that uh focus on the action not the outcome which is which basically means that 95% of what you do is going to result in failure it's going to result in failure but the lessons you learn during those failures are basically going to lead to your success so what you have to do is really focus on the action <clears throat> because the outcome is not under your control only the action is so uh, if you attach your uh, uh, how motivated you are if 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 how motivated you are depends completely on the outcome you receive then what's going to happen is if you have a good day you're going to be motivated if you have a bad day you're going to be disappointed but uh, the attitude you need to have is that uh, as long as you figure out the right direction that's why you need to find a mentor if you have figured out the right direction you just need to keep at it without a desire for outcome just focus on the right action and the outcome would come that is the one thing that i feel i would definitely tell my 18 year old self also now that's good advice second thing is if you were to write something now that could be put in a time capsule for your great 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 grandchildren to read what would you want them to read what would i want them to read um i think i would i would write that when i was when i when i'm very old right now i don't think i'm in a position to really <laughs> tell my grandchildren because because if you see what happens is every single year <clears throat> your perception of life changes That's and I don't want to give my I don't I, I don't want to give my grandchildren great 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 grandchildren wrong advice. <laughs> that's Because, that's the first, that's the first time I've heard that. It's very it's a very good way of looking at it for sure. Yeah, that is yeah. very true. Yeah. Because at 18 I thought I knew everything and I was completely wrong. Yeah. No, no, that's that's one of the best answers I've heard for sure because I found that to be the case with myself, you know, over the last yeah. few your yeah. life and your your perception of certain things definitely changes and molds. So, no, good answer. Yeah. <laughs> um mm-hmm. and the last one is you're on your deathbed, you're 90 deathbed. years old, you're really re- reflecting on your life. I'm lucky. Yeah. <laughs> what what would you want your life to look like? What was what is the message you want to leave behind for your life for the world? Uh the same thing that i uh, that i just told you that uh i want people to look at me as uh, somebody who tried his best to go after his full potential tried his absolute best and died trying to achieve it so uh, somebody who went after his dreams and died with no regrets that's what i want to be awesome Uh, so that's amazing advice. This this conversation has been amazing. Our uh, people are going to get fired up listening to this one. So I'm excited mm. to hear people's feedback. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak on above. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you. Thank you so much man. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's an honor. Yeah. No problem.